Okay, so I'll introduce our speaker. Uh, before I do, let me explain kind of the auspice under which we invited the speaker, okay? Um, in 1965, uh, a book that was later translated into English as Freud and Philosophy. Uh, in that book, Paul Ricoeur coined what would become a very famous phrase. He called it the hermeneutics of suspicion, um, pointing to kind of a school of thought. And this school of thought, uh, Ricoeur argued, emerged in the 19th century uh, with Marx and Nietzsche before arriving at even greater theoretical sophistication uh, maturity with Freud's concept of the unconscious in the early 20th century. And these thinkers, this trio, right, Marx, Nietzsche, Freud, um, transformed the concept of interpretation, uh, Ricoeur says, uh, from the reconstruction of textual meaning uh, to what uh, Ricoeur called an act of demystification, a reduction of illusion. Uh, Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud, uh, he said, viewed consciousness primarily as false consciousness, uh, such that any meaning, any meaning, whether moral or social or aesthetic or what have you, uh, was seen as a surrogate of something hidden, something repressed or violent or mystified. Um, now, by naming this tendency toward suspicion in the 1960s, Ricoeur was far from exorcising it. Uh, deconstruction, just beginning to appear uh, on the scene in the mid-1960s, would take suspicion further still, uh, perhaps especially in the work of Paul de Mon, uh, who asserted uh, that constitutional falsehood informs language and hence all human consciousness. Uh, that there's, it operates kind of a double register at once, but never at more than one at the same time, at least in consciousness, so that what you think you're saying, something else is happening in the language, and you've got to kind of what's happening in the language, something else is being said on the surface. It's a, it's a complicated arrangement. But what it says is that uh, no interpretation can be exhausted, meaning also always exceeds what we intend it to mean, et cetera. And uh, Demont took that kind of thinking quite far. And in fact, there was a, this was a profoundly widespread notion uh, that whatever we're thinking, something else is happening not only in our consciousness, but in language, language that we use. And it informed virtually every aspect of contemporary thought uh, you know, postmodernism, at least certain branches of it, uh, cultural studies, new historicism, and more. Uh, now, it's difficult to date the precise moment uh, when the ethos of suspicion began itself to be called into question by scholars. Uh, but today, a wide range of ideas, reading practices, and schools of interpretation uh, exercise what we might call a kind of a faith. A faith in, and it could be a s a faith in sincerity, a faith in communication, a faith in the empirical verifiability of interpretations by, for example, teaching computers to read and then crunching textual data, uh, a faith in science, a faith in our capacity to enter into the secret life of objects, and even in some cases, a faith in religion. Um, and because this post-suspicious mood is so pervasive, and because it raises new and interesting and important questions about so many things, including religion, uh, we thought we'd choose as our Humanities Center annual theme uh, the phrase, after suspicion, dot, dot, dot. You know, so, okay, so what now? Where are we? What's happening? And yet, uh, it's fair to ask whether the effects of this new spirit of the age have been entirely salutary. Uh, or whether it's necessary to ask them important questions about this new mood. Uh, skeptical, or at least open-minded, if not themselves suspicious questions. And to help us think through this question about where we are and what it means and why we sh might not be so content with where we are, uh, we invited today's guest uh, to speak to us. And that guest is Greg Lambert. Um, uh, Professor Lambert uh, earned his PhD in 1995 in comparative literature and critical theory from the University of California at Irvine under the direction of Jacques Derrida and the German literary theorist Gabriel Schwab. Uh, prior to this, Lambert was a fellow in the Center for Hermeneutic Studies at the Graduate Theological Union uh, in Berkeley, where he completed a master's program in theology and literature and also um, pursued graduate studies in French and comp lit at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, he joined the uh, Department of, S of English in Syracuse uh, in 1996, and nine years later, 2005, was named chair of that department, uh, and he held that position for three years and then uh, left it to become the founding director of the Syracuse Humanities Center. Uh, since 2008, he's also served as the principal investigator and director of the Central New York Humanities Corridor which is a, a kind of a big deal, and it's a, it's a, it's a regional collaborative uh, research network 
between Syracuse and Cornell, uh, University of Rochester, and what's called the NY6 uh, Liberal Arts Consortium, uh, which has been supported by the Mellon Foundation uh, very, I'd say, lavishly, if at least generously, more than what we've got, uh, and, and um, is really kind of a, a very vital intellectual enterprise. Uh, in addition to running this humanities corridor, Professor Lambert's directed several other multi-institutional and major uh, research initiatives, including the Society for the Study of Biopolitical Futures, uh, the Transdisciplinary Media Studio, uh, and the Perpetual Peace Project. He's written or edited uh, about a dozen books and several dozen articles in peer-reviewed journals and critical editions, uh, and he's very highly regarded for his uh, writings on the contemporary humanities, uh, critical theory, philosophy, the Baroque, uh, and done a lot of work on the work of Derrida and also the French philosopher Gilles Deleuze. Um, he lectures very widely. Uh, he's been a visiting uh, fellow all over the place, places like Holland and Korea and Australia and places in the U.S. Uh, and I learned in the past 24 hours he's also a very congenial conversationalist uh, and a great guest. So please join me welcoming Greg Lambert. Well, thank you. Thank you, Matt. Well, that's a wonderful introduction, if not a little too long. Um, I'm going to have to shorten my bios when I send them, or I just won't send my web pages anymore or anything like that. I really want, I'm really pleased to be here. I uh, want to thank Brooke, particularly for all of the organization. It's been really wonderful. I had a nice night at the guest house last night. The mountains, you know, looking at the mountains with the clouds over it was just sublime to be able to go out for the walk this morning in the chilly Utah air, the fall air, so I, I really appreciated that. But I mean, the high point so far has been a uh, conversation that I had with faculty and students uh, this afternoon over some of the work that I, uh, over the book, uh, basically we could hold that up a little bit or maybe. Uh, so what I'll be talking about today really is, when I was invited I didn't have time to really kind of like do a complete brand spanking new lecture. So what I wanted to do is just try to introduce some of the main arguments of the book called Return Statements on uh, the return of religion in contemporary philosophy. And Matt has already outlined, in a sense, the historical and the recent historical context for it. So my book takes up what is the most recent of many returns of religion um, in contemporary uh, philosophical thought. And this one occurred in the context of, um, or immediately in the wake of 9-11 in North America within philosophy and within academic philosophy in particular and within the strand of what was previously hermeneutic, uh, the philosophy of hermeneutics or deconstruction. So I wanted to, so my book is in many ways to raise questions about the relationship between one, this return of religion into the religious discussion, philosophical themes within philosophy, academic philosophy, and two, the return of religion in the sense of what has been called the post-secular turn um, of the rise of fundamentalisms globally again, of Islam, of even Christianity, of Christian fundamentalism during this period, if we think about the elections uh, during the period immediately after, and the presidency of Bush particularly. So um, I think that uh, so the relationship between, it, between these two things have not been examined, and that's the purpose historically of my book. So let me just talk a little bit about to give it a context and then I go into the question of what is philosophical fundamentalism today, which is the, t the, the title of my lecture. So a return statement refers to a term in computer logic denoting a subroutine or a program, which I use to describe what had commonly been called the post-secular turn in contemporary or con continental philosophy and theory which has been taking place in North America and UK during this period after 9-11, even though there's a tradition actually of this that dates back much earlier to French phenomenological circles from the early 1980s. In my writings from the latter period of the tradition, my critical response to the phenomena was primarily motivated, as I just said, by a series of questions concerning its relationship to another sense of the post-secular that was taking place just after 9-11. I wondered, for example, 
how these two returns of religion could be taking place so near to one another without being directly linked. And like, like for instance, the same horizon viewed from two different perspectives of the globe. From one perspective, the horizon of re religion was viewed as an evening or a decline. From another, as a morning of the next day or the next age of a time after religion. According to the first horizon, the semantic and cultural meaning of religion was weakening and philosophically pacific, though not necessarily pacifist. However, from the second horizon, mostly ascribed to the Islamic wor world, even though in the same period there were so-called fundamentalisms gaining support in North America and Europe, as we've seen as well, there was a very literal meaning attached to the term religion and according to the sense was the demo most direct signification of the phenomena that could not, for that reason, undergo any possible metaphorical substitution, for example, standing for culture or belief system. Moreover, from the horizon of the morning of the next day, the weakening of the sense of religion opened another new uh, set of new semantic possibilities uh, for other terms like community, faith, love, God. These became weakened in their religious significance and therefore opened up possibilities that these would have new meaning in, an, in a different age. Thus, weakness was also presented as a method of striking through or crossing out the literal or fundamentalist sense of the term religion. One could proclaim, for example, one's faith without necessarily being religious, just as one could be a militant without proclaiming violence, or a fanatic without necessarily being a fundamentalist. The term itself did not evoke any bond, any oath, or any allegiance. It only required the most abstract obligation to the virtues of faith, truth, love, and community. It seemed that the only mortal enemy was in fact the literal and historical senses of the term religion itself, which seemed today or at that moment to be setting on the West and threatening the West at the same time. In my earlier responses to these dual horizons of what I call the death of God, the death of religion, or the passing of religion, in the spring of 2002, which also corresponded to the death of my best friend, the death of God theologian, Charlie Winquist. So there's a little bit of a personal aspect of the death of God or also corresponded to the death of the death of God theologian. I began to critique the implicit assumptions underlining the return of religion and the religious and questioned the frequency of Christian themes that began to circulate through the work of contemporary theorists such as John D. Caputo, Jean-Luc Nancy, a former teacher of mine, Giorgio Agamben, the Italian theorist, and Benjamin, I will give an example of his work, but as well as the work of so-called atheists like Alain Badiou and Slavoj Žižek. At the center of my earliest debates were what I often called to as an all too Catholicized appropriation of Derrida's own later writings on the questions of religion and faith, particularly by the North American philosopher Caputo, but also by the writings of his own disciple, Nancy, in a book called The Deconstruction of Christianism, Christianism, Christianisme. My earlier debates with Caputo were well known and were the focus of a public forum in, that took place in the American Academy of Religion in 2003, which was subsequently published along with Caputo's reply in, a in the Journal of Cultural and Religious Theory, which is an online journal that I founded along with Winquist and the other theologian, Carl Raschke. However, uh, I also was interested in Derrida's own writings and particularly in the philosophy of Nancy, which covers a lot of the book. For me, what was most troubling was the different senses attributed to the term religion that was being ascribed to these different horizons that I talked about of the so-called post-secular. Let us keep in mind, and this is something that, I that will underwrite everything that I say today. Um, I say about the term religion is that there is no, in fact, no proper origin for what it designates. No proper philological, etymological, philosophical, or even th theological origin. That the history of the term itself is bound up with the historical development of Western institutions, in particular um, after Rome, the rise of the Roman Empire. Following Derrida, I employ the work of the Indo-European linguist Emil Benveniste concerning the absence of what he defined as any proper original or proper meaning of the term religion uh, from either its Latin or Greek senses, 
which is actually derived from three etymological sources, which he says merely serve as its equivalents. The first source is the Greek term threskia, which means cult or ritual observance. The second is the ambiguous senses according to, accorded to the Latin term religio, which, which one sense in the Roman sense, purely Roman sense, means to have scruples, to have what we would today call morals or to have a set of in inhibitions concerning actions that define, in a sense, a sphere of action and practice that defines the religious. But in another sense, which becomes, according to Benveniste, a very particularly Christianized sense of the term, which is drawn from the word religari, which means to have an obligation or to make an oath. In other words, there is this conflict between these two senses of these two Latin words that are or conflict over the determination to, as an oath or an obligation. But even the stronger sense of religari, the oath or an obligation that binds the subject to a site or a place. Um, and we could think of, for instance, in the Christian religion, particularly the, site, the place of either baptism, conversion, or death, crucifixion, or both at the same time. It is this latter sense of religio that Derrida and Benveniste argue emerge as the equivalent under, um, under its modern or contemporary senses of the proper meaning, serve as the proper meaning of the term religio because it is bound to the objective determination of a particular institution and particularly to a form of the state, to a juridical form, to a form of an institution itself. Now I'm going to skip over I'm, um, a little bit the um, I just I try to describe that, which I talked about today in my conversation with the graduate students or with the students and with the faculty, is that the book, the return statements, is also a performance of a certain kind of skeptical attitude, and I try to make the skeptical attitude very rich. It's not a denial of religion. It's not a denial of faith. In fact, the opposition of skepticism is not to faith, to fideism, but to forms of dogmatism, and so what I try to do is perform in the contemporary moment a certain kind of skeptical response to this in, in a way to conflict with, in a sense, certain claims concerning what the meaning of religion is, a definite meaning of its decline, of the post-secular, and so forth. But the skeptical response leaves open or leaves possible um, an experience or an existence of faith that cannot be approached simply by philosophy or by concepts. Okay. Now I'll turn to what I mean by philosophical fundamentalism, because this is a little bit of an irony in terms of how I defined it, or what I call fundamental philosophy. I use this term in two related senses of the return statement that I'll be glossing today to try to add what was published with more example and commentary and conclude with two contemporary examples of what I call the return of religion in contemporary philosophy. According to the first sentence, the first sense of the term philosophical fundamentalism, it refers to the formation of philosophical identity through a strong difference, an opposition or even hostility to faith or religion, which was at the basis of, let's say, several Enlightenment philosophies or certainly rationalism or the history of rationalism in Europe, often between philosophy and religion, or as we will see later, between reason and faith. According to a second sense, fundamentalist or fundamental refers to a philosophy based on first principles, metaphysics, okay? So in a sense that it refers to a more architectonic metaphor of foundational, the appeal to a first philosophy, to a concept of God, or to a concept of a prime mover in physics, um, to an Aristotelian framework, or to a theological framework as the basis for, to an ontological framework, which is returning today, as I argue in the book, also in strange places like in uh, um, in um, speculative realism or an object-oriented ontology, which also takes the form of a first philosophy, of a fundamental philosophy, foundational philosophy, which claims an access to experience or a uh, meaning or the being of an object without any empirical or any subjective relation to that. So this is, in a sense, a return of a certain kind of foundationalism within contemporary philosophy and even in the phrase new materialism today. So to address the first sense, which I'm not going to deal with the second sense as much directly today, 
Let's begin by referring to a statement that appears actually very early on in Heidegger's 1927-28 lecture course in Marburg. He wrote, theology is a positive science and as such is absolutely different from philosophy. Here Heidegger's precise term absolute refers to a difference that is not soluble, that cannot be mixed up, it cannot be diluted or weakened or watered down in any way in order to remain philosophy. It is for this reason that he states later on, very explicitly, there can be no Christian philosophy. Why? Because philosophy demands, quote, a fundamental shift of view this mediate, uh, that immediately sets it on a divergent path from any theological viewpoint, unquote. In fact, according to Heidegger's dictum, such a div divergence cannot even be called a shared conviction in the sense of an ontological partition to both, to both share a and divide up two different regions of being or the ontic. In other words, it, it has to be, philosophy claims all of being and does not share that claim with theology, uh, fundamentally, okay? Since it always appears that philosophy departs from theology by means of its own method, its own scientific or phenomenological method, which in this case is the phenomenology properly speaking. Consequently, as opposing sciences, philosophy and theology cannot divide up, much less share the same region of being or beings in common. It is because they belong to different, absolutely different regions that they have different points of view, which is also suggests that the difference that we are speaking about is not conceptual or linguistics, as if theology would disclose the same region simply by another language game. So these are all the differences that Heidegger was saying. No, it's, it's an absolute difference that cannot be represented by any kind of language, by any kind of cultural viewpoint, Weltanschauen or anything else. So in fact, the absolute difference is neither logical or formal, but is factical. This is Heidegger's early definition of Dasein, based on the nature or belief or the priority and behavior of believing that defines the existential co comportment or Dasein of the nature of truth, of the revolution, revelation of truth in each case and the procedure that arrives at truth. To put this differently, rather prosaically for the purposes of this talk, while the Christian first believes and then uses procedures of reason to justify or to communicate this prior conviction, thus theology is founded primarily on a form of faith, the philosopher first employs reason and then gradually comes to a point of conviction concerning truthfulness of the first principles upon which that procedure is based, a conviction that sometimes appears like a form of belief or even faith. Thus. Philosophy is primarily founded on a form of reason. Now these are, again, very prosaic and we could problematize these and I will problematize Heidegger's claims here. The second uh, conviction, distinction, at least according to Heidegger, is that Christian belief is existential or practical in its essence and thus cannot be appropriately grasped in a theoretical concept and does not originate from, uh, and that do not originate from an existential state of faithfulness, which is actually a very interesting claim. In other words, that, that, that in a sense, to be theoretical is to distort or misrepresent the very truth claim or procedure that is used um, in order to be able to establish, in a sense, the existential comportment of what is essential to faith, to the experience of faith. For example, take the crucifixion, according to the Pauline statement, the statements of Paul, Christ is risen, or Christ is Lord, quote, one never knows about this fact only in believing it, okay, unquote. If this absolute difference was not stated clearly enough, a little further on in a famous passage, Heidegger creates or recasts this ontic ontological opposition in incredibly strong terms as an existential opposition, that philosophy and faith are absolutely different. Quote, this peculiar relationship does not exclude but includes the fact that faith as a specific possibility of existence is in its innermost core the mortal enemy Todsfind, of the form of existence that is the essential part of philosophy that is factic that it is factically ever changing okay let me just uh, uh, apprise you that i'm going to call into question all of these statements and ask why is, we need to remind ourselves, Heidegger's making these claims in 1927, on the eve of 1930, 
We know what happens in National Socialism at this time. Many of these claims return on the decisiveness and on the, uh, the strong difference or opposition around the issue of Nazism, around his attraction to National Socialism. So this is a very problematic terrain, but I want to ask, this does find a certain way of thinking about um, uh, a certain kind of uh, philosophical fundamentalism, I would say, that we am representing by the example of Heidegger. How does one be a fundamentalist philosopher? Okay, let me skip down. So, speaking more, there is even in Heidegger's language a hostility between philosophy and faith that emerges historically from the fact that the form of existence of faith belongs or is likened to another culture that Dasein reacts to in the creation of its own particular or unique history. One wonders, however, according to Heidegger's hypothesis, whether the origin of religion is always bound up with what he calls a reaction to bear life, and this is the term that Agamben uses. It is in reacting to the mere or bareness of life that both philosophy and religion originate in their Dasein, in their belief systems, which means that they re emerge reactively against life itself, or the definition of life itself. Um, and in doing so, change the very principle of life. And this is a really interesting thesis uh, in terms of how each philosophy and religion take as their fundamental concepts zoe, life, fusis, nature, or God, the principle or the creator, ens creator of life, okay? So it's also a very interesting argument if you think about the, uh, the question of, of the emergence of both forms or both cultures. For example, we might see this double movement of reaction and hostility that it terms determines the social or historical mo movement of emergence of social identity as well, including sexual identity or ethnic identity, which is also tied to the creation of new cultures and new proclamations of factical existence, of, as well as new forms of mitzain, of, being, of sharing community or sharing a certain determination of identity in common. These are also at the root of a determination of what religion is. It's the emergence of identity that is communal and factical at the same time, based upon a fact. But always appear against other differences that are ascribed to past cultural and social formations of existence. The differences, for instance, determined by Eurocentric historical culture or heterosexual social identity, for example, sexual identity or gender identity. These new proclamations of existential difference might even said to be resemble positions of faith or religion within the contemporary and modern world. Although these new cultures of faith do not always strictly appear within the form of religious phenomena, so-called or defined, I would argue that they share the same sense of facticity, of being factically anchored in experience or in existence, born from the same demand for a new meaning and a new creation of historical, dis of, of a living culture that grows from this proclamation of identity. And thus could be said to belong to the same history as the history of religions that have unfolded from earlier sources, from earlier proclamations, including the Christian proclamations. As Heidegger remarks, whether understood in a positive sense bound up with the diversity of historical formations, or in a negative sense in which the history appears as a burden or hindrance to the moment of creation itself, like, for instance, when we say Eurocentrism today, or in, in, it is often a claim that says that history is what is an obstacle now or a past that binds us or prevents a new creation of the future or a new creation of culture. So these, in a sense, have um, a vivid demonstration of a certain notion of that facticity is where life emerges and seeks to assert its, to secure itself against a past. But in philosophy also, we might acknowledge that the hostility is also historical. This already presupposes that there are other forms of faith that could emerge to take place, uh, religious forms of faith in other historical moments. Thus, what Heidegger calls absolute difference could take the form of a reaction against religion in one historical moment of philosophy, that is the Enlightenment. A reaction against bourgeois morality in the next, 
in the 19th century as a reaction of particularly Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud against a certain bourgeois morality in the state um, uh, that, in a sense, is a re uh, that develops into a culture of philosophy. And then a reaction against the faith in science and administrative logic that takes the form of the Frankfurt School in, in the immediate pre-war years and the suspicion of certain forms of fascism and modern totalitarianism. And a reaction against, um, uh, finally, a reaction against secularism that belongs to the history of this modern philosophy itself, which is, in a sense, a reaction that defines the, the phenomena of a return to religion into philosophy. It was a reaction against this anti-humanist and secular moment within the history of philosophy itself that defines, in a sense, that negative moment. So now I return to this notion of what, what is occurring here, because we could say that Heidegger actually is more of a kind of, at this moment, at this earlier moment in the 1920s, more of a fundamentalist philosopher. But that fundamentalism was a claim for a philosophical identity to protect philosophy from something else that was encroaching upon its terrain and to, and to define it at the same time. In an odd way, we've seen an, a reversal. The loss of that philosophical fundamentalism, which that secularism as a fundamental or core identity of philosophy, and a return of something like faith at the basis of what constitutes philosophy or the discourse of philosophy today. Today, it appears now in the wake of a loss of faith in reason or in science or, the, or of uh, faith in, pro in the progress of history, history or in Eurocentrism and particularly modernism that is, that is the factically changing nature of truth that now appears as the entire problem of philosophy's own subjective form of existence and the possibility it has for a future. So that we see, oddly enough, in critical theorists like Zizek or Badiou or Agamben, a claim that is based more on a form of faith or certainty, a faith in the return of an absolute form of universalism, communism, an absolute communism, or a faith in the return of a certain millennial understanding or eschatology, eschatological understanding of the end of history in Agamben that I'll talk about in the last two examples. At this point, let me, let me turn to the middle of my lecture and just summarize Heidegger's earlier claim of absolute different difference between faith and philosophy, which I say is now a thing of the past, okay? Could we actually call Heidegger at this stage a fundamentalist philosopher in the same way that we say, we also say fundamentalist Christian or fundamentalist Muslim? Um, in the above passage, the three terms that he italicizes are faith, form of existence, and philosophy. This underlies and clarifies the extreme nature of an opposition. Philosophy and theology are opposed on all three terms, okay? Philosophy is not opposed to, however, to theology per se, but as Heidegger says, to faith as a form of existence. Faithful existence is a mortal enemy of philo philosophical existence, almost the same sense that it has been said by some, both historically and in the modern world today, that Islam, or fundamentalist Islam, is a mortal enemy of the West or of Christianity at different moments. What is the peculiar about this absolute opposition between two worldviews is that philosophy, for its part, according to Heidegger, never even wants to encounter this mortal enemy in open combat. As I said above, it is for this reason that philosophy historically seems to want to withdraw from the field of combat or conflict to live in another possible world, a world not defined by faith. Moreover, it is only by understanding the opposition that, it, that the philosophy and theology actually resolve to live in incompossible worlds, according to the, that they can ever, in the future, ever hope to communicate. And that's Heidegger's argument. It's only because they live in different worlds that they can actually talk. Thus, it would seem that the affirmation of an absolute difference is, an, uh, of overt, is not of overt expression of struggle or kampf, uh, but a suspension of, of any kind of, of actual violence. And in some ways, this almost resembles, at the same time, um, Schmitt's uh, thesis concerning, um, concerning the friend and enemy distinction as being the most decisive, decisive distinction of the political, of the definition of the political. It's almost as if, this moment, Heidegger was doing the same thing in philosophy try to define 
philosophy on a fundamental difference. So let me turn to my response to these, this earlier phenomenon. My response to this claim of absu absolute difference between theology and philosophy, or between faith and philosophy, I would like to maintain whether I factically believe it or not, that is, I don't give assent to its either uh, exists or to its negation, if only to cause something uh, to appear against our historical moment on either side of the line which has been crossed through, is that not only uh, by some philosophers and theorists today, if there is a concerted, as if there is a concerted attempt to leap outside the squared circle of this absolute difference between theology and faith. I'm saying this in the obvious, obvious light that contra Heidegger, and not only is there something that could be called today Christian philosophy, or even Christian deconstruction, but that many philosophers and theologians are actually speaking today in a manner that is virtually indistinguishable, and are even relying on the same authorities for their arguments. For example, I'll quote in the end in my examples, Agamben or Badiou, the atheist, uh, both rely on St. Paul for their most recent arguments on philosophy. This is not simply saying that many so-called philosophers are reading the Christian Bible with a renewed and somewhat peculiar fervor, although this is certainly uh, the case and could we could easily list off the names of the most illustrious members of a certain tradition of continental philosophy to discover that they are also members of a newly founded Bible study group in philosophy that includes Zizek and Badiou, as weekly uh, participants. This may even be called, in a colloquial sense of the term, a religious phenomenon. But I find it peculiar only in the sense that this would not even have been thinkable just 20 years ago. As recently, in the same tradition of continental philosophy and in the same form of critical theory. So something must have changed in terms of this fervor or the question of after suspicion that we are clearly after suspicion. But I also find it peculiar that in the same period that we are speaking in the context of a geopolitical reality which is marked, in fact, by a renewed hostility uh, between what could be called the two major religions of the book, or the books of books, if we don't include, we could also include the Book of Mormon here, but I don't want to do that. I wonder, would this phenomenon not signal a weakening of the absolute difference posited by Heidegger? Although Heidegger forecloses the very possibility of a Christian philosophy, famously he likens it to a squared circle, he still seems to allow for occasions when the difference becomes relativistic or weakened by calls and by allusions and attempts at weak mediation." Unquote. However, this still pre presupposes a fundamental hostility that is either pacified by ecumenical feelings. But the most important question is, why has the implicit and presupposed term of philosophy, the post-secular, not resulted in more open instances of hostility or antagonism between these two former sciences, that is, between philosophy itself or between theology? Perhaps my first, I thought, my first I thought hypothesis would be the following, which I'll return to in the final examples, namely, that this has something to do with the decline of an identification between philosophy and science, between particularly its Cartesian basis and the emergence and its development through phenomenology. That today, contemporary philosophy, I'm not speaking of all traditions of philosophy, for instance, analytic philosophy, still is founded to a great degree on logic and on the theories of logic, but I'm speaking of a continental tradition of philosophy which is not no longer, uh, which has problematized its relation to science and needs to find another basis in order to found, found itself. The found, uh, that foundation or found, uh, has, to be, has to take place. Do philosophy and uh, theology share the, the uh, same region of being ontologically speaking or belong to the same pre-philosophical disclosure ontologically? This is something that, that Heidegger asks and then refuses. On the other hand, regarded what is called theological thinking today, one might immediately point out the fact that a certain tradition of modern theology in North America, but also in uh, the United Kingdom, Germany, and France, are primarily influenced by post-Heideggerian uh, post tradition of philosophy, including deconstruction. Thus, students in many re religion departments, and I am also speaking from firsthand experience, 
often spend less time reading classical theological sources or the writings of systematic theologians like Aquinas, Bart, Lonergan, Tillich, than reading the same continental philosophers who we found above uh, attending the same Bible study reading group every week. And that, in a sense, that the reference to the notion of practical theology or practical theology has declined within uh, particularly religion departments, has been replaced by other forms of uh, social sciences, by anthropology and so forth. So the notion of a systematic or practical theology has also declined during the same period. And yet, I will return to my major question, or provocation, if you like. What happened to the absolute difference between philosophy and faith? In other words, if philosophy is simply another form of faith, or in fact, a rediscovery of the same faith, then where is philosophy today? If my first hypothesis was that this has something to do with the decline of a scientific or phenomenal phenomenological method within a certain tradition of philosophy, even in the field of phenomenology itself, which never really existed in the United States or in North America, only existed in the form of post-structuralism and in the theories of postmodernism. That is, it was carried forward into North America and particularly through the writings of Derrida and others. There was never really a properly philosophical foundation of phenomenology in particularly, I'm speaking of academically, within philosophy departments in the United States. Therefore, my second hypothesis concerns the aforementioned sense of ambiguity. What is this ambiguity but an expression, whether lexical or semantic, of a weakened difference? Thus, the absolute difference earlier posited by Heidegger becomes ambiguous difference, and this has led both theology and, and philosophy to have foreclosed their relation to science, whether it's in its Cartesian determination or its Hegelian determination of absolute knowledge, to confront the most essential ambiguity with, the, with regard to its own identity, which is the relation between faith and knowledge, which is, in a sense, a form of a crisis that both share. How can you found, in a sense, a knowledge on faith and still call it philosophy? Let me turn to, uh, in a sense, a conclusion by giving you these examples. This is the, this is the meat of the thing where I'll show you what I'm talking about. So to sum things up, let's take a uh, pro proclamation or proposition by Jean-Luc Nancy, the philosopher, one of the philosophers I talk about. Let's say then that today Christian or Christianity is the thing itself that is to be thought by philosophy. That's what he says. It is the only thing that philosophy should think about, its relation to Christianity. And it could think about that relation also as its ultimate destination as the manner in which philosophy can found or create its own new identity. These are claims that exist in the literature, and this is, one of the, this is one of the statements that I critique or actually take up as one of the contemporary return statements today. This happens in two ways, according to Nancy. One, here's the one statement. The only Christianity that can be actual is the one that contemplates the present possibility of its negation. Unquote. So in other words, the only contemporary, the only current, the only actual Christianity that means anything is a Christianity that must contemplate, whether in the form uh, historically of Western institutions, whether in terms of globalization, whether in terms of its essence, essential unfolding of the West and its identity with the West, it must con contemplate the possibility of its ending, of a uh, time after the age of Christianity. That's the only Christianity that counts as Christianity for Nancy. Second, the only, now that's one possibility, one path for philosophy today. So if there are philosophers here, the, you know, you can go off and, and do that. That's your, your walking papers for the future. Second, if you're atheists, are there any atheists here today? Okay, good. The only thinking that is actual, meaning contemporary with itself, meaning co-determinant contemporary, and the, and the question of atheism itself is an atheism that contemplates the reality of its Christian origins. So these are very provocative and I think very subtle statements because you notice his use of the word negation and contemplation in the first statement and his notion of um, 
the contemplation and reality of Christian origins in the second statement. So the only true atheism is an atheism that contemplates the reality of its own Christian origins, and the only true Christianity is a Christianity that contemplates its possible negation. So I might define these as two paths or two conflicting or competing horizons of the return of religion and philosophy today that has replaced Heidegger's earlier philosophical fundamentalism when we were so certain about the identity of philosophy and so certain about the identity of theology or faith that we never had to think about their difference. So I would prefer to say that we notice these horizons are both defined negatively and even by a presumption of the gradual disappearance of religion itself in a positive form at the basis of both statements and what it formally designated, leaving in place of it a future something like a religion without religion, which is a phrase that's used quite often by Caputo but also by Nancy, a deconstruction or self-deconstruction of Christianity or Christianism. According to the first path, explicitly, the Christian content of philosophy is negated, negating the thing itself of Christianity, but leaving in place the concepts which are also Christian in origin. And I'll give you an example of that in a moment. For the purpose of this lecture and because of lack of time, and here I'm playing a little pun on the contemporary time we live in today as the time of the end of days, the eschaton, the, uh, according to a phrase of the Ephesians that Agamben quotes in his book, the time that remains. I'm also referring to the time of my talk. I will not follow Nancy's resolution on these two paths, but in a sense take up the two examples of this two statements. The first statement, the example of Agamben's work today as a Christianity that contemplates the possibility of its negation. And for the second statement, Badiou, as an atheism that fundamentally takes up the question of atheism as a contemplation of the reality of its Christian origin origins. First example, the only Christianity that can be actual is the one that contemplates the present possibility of its negation. To begin, I would remind you of the importance for Agamben of Schmidt's original gesture and genealogical method of the identity between juridical and political or secular concepts and their theological and religi religious antecedents. That's the basis of Schmidt's thesis that all juridical and political concepts are originally theological concepts that have secularized, it's a secular thesis. So this is in a sense, again, a return to this notion of secularization. All significant concepts of modern theory of states are secularized theological concepts. This is commonly referred to as Schmidt's secularization thesis, which rests on a structural, not an actual, but a structural identity of theological and juridical concepts as developed in the second volume of political theology. Agamben's major project actually can be understood if we think of homo soccer onward. Um, and if there are students here of Agamben, we could talk about this. As a realization or actualization of this conceptual identity in order to reverse this process of secularization, in order to affect uh, a reintegration of the actual original theological or religious concepts into secular and juridical concepts. So we think of homo sacco and the relation of sovereignty or the state of exception and the relation of that to, um, in a sense, the ban on life that is affected religiously on in, in homo sacco. This is both radicalized Schmidt's thesis based on antinomy of concepts, identity, meaning the antinomy of identity of concepts, and surpasses it in both canceling out and lifting up in a contemporary historical moment. It denies any originality to the political concepts themselves. That is, secular concepts are not proper concepts because they have forgotten or foreclosed their original, uh, their original theological meanings. And it's Gombin's work in a hermeneutic sense to recover those original theological sources in order to reverse this process of secularization that is, in a sense, been the greatest problem for us, which is that of life exposed to pure sovereignty and law without any grace. Okay. So here I'm thinking especially of Heidegger's claim from the Phenomenology of Theology lectures. He had earlier said that philosophy is the formal corrective of the pre-Christian content of theological concepts, 
Agamben reverses that and says that today, the definition of the work of theology is the corrective of the pre-secular content of philosophical and political concepts. So an example, I will uh, talk about his book. Here I will demonstrate this operation by turning to two key citations in a passage concerning what he calls the tupos, or the figure of time, in the book The Time That Remains, especially the messianic figure of time in its fullness and recapitulation, a word that I underline, which Agamben also uh, claim, finds in Walter Benjamin's thesis on history. Agamben claims this is structurally identical and thus echo, echoing Schmidt's gesture between theological and juridical figures concepts, except here the figures are of Jewish or Christian concepts of messianic temporality, the antinomy between Pauline and Benjamin figures of the Messiah, a secular or Jude a Jewish source and a Christian and a theological source that he brings together and says these are identical concepts in his work. Referring to Paul's use of the Greek term anaktuphalos, I'm not sure if I said that correctly, which Agamben claims literally means to recapitulate. And I'll read the passage in a second. In reference to an essential passage from the Ephesians, where, quote, Paul lays out the divine project of redemption of history. Okay, this is a quote from Agamben. Paul writes, quote, as for the economy of the pleroma of all times, the fullness of all times, all things are recapitulated in him, things in heaven and on earth. How many people remember this? This is from the Ephes Ephesians. This is after his divine plan. It says that in Christ or in the Lord, all things are recapitulated in heaven and on earth, and that basically the, all the fullness of times are present to one another in this time, in this time, the end of times. Of course, perhaps as an aside, I might want to, we might want to quibble with Agamben's exegetical skills on this passage, since actually Paul did not write the letter to the Ephesians, and perhaps even for his skills as a Greek translator, since the verb recapitulate is a bit forced, if you think about it, particularly if Paul was writing to an early Christian or basically um, a Greek audience that were mostly not all composed of literate people. So in a sense, the Greek term is possible to translate that, but it doesn't really carry forward the metaphor that he's talking about. So actually, in a sense, what he's addressing is a more literal rendering of the above sentence would be, as for the administration of all times in their fullness, embracing the times in a messianic age in their entirety, all things are summed up under one head. Meaning, in an economic sense, everything occurs in the same balance sheet, and Christ is the one who calculates everything in, in you know, basically all times add up to this one moment in this one present. Things on heaven and on earth. So recapitulate gets that, but in a sense, Agamben chooses it probably because of its metaphorical notion of cap, all capital, all, you know, the head, cap, you know, recapitulated. So he uses a metaphorical way of thinking about it in order to be able to try to render the same sense. But what is it that is recapitulated, actually, and then Agamben claims in this short verse, quote, laden with meaning, that is to say, full to the point that it's overflowing, to the point that one could say that several key philosophical claims and passages of Western culture are simply consequences of the explication, the overflowingness of this one passage from the Ephesians. This is Agamben's claim. So what are the fundamental texts that Agamben refers to as proclaiming can all be summed up by this one passage in the Ephesians, by this one quote? That is, Agamben lists them in no particular order on his balance sheet. They are the doctrines of apoxis in origin and Leibniz, repetition and retrieval in Kierkegaard, the eternal return in Nietzsche and in Heidegger, and the theory of repetition in all philosophy that follows Heidegger. So here you see the original verse from the Ephesians now functions as the heading in which you can add up all these theories of time and temporality and their fullness, and in a sense it restores then the original meaning that is no longer secularized by these philosophical texts, but in a sense return to their theological source in Paul, or actually the quasi-Paul that wrote the Ephesians. They are like metaphors or analogies, partial expressions that do not add up to the fullness 
of the original verse, but which more function like fragments of an original creation of an explosion of the universe that in a sense landed at different points historically in these different historical moments, including the theory of the eternal return in Nietzsche and in Heidegger. It's quite an amazing, and I, I, I admire philosophy that does this, but the question is, is, Paul, is Agamben at that point actually able to speak as a philosopher at this moment when he makes this proclamation? This is a proclamation. The truth of all texts, all these philosophical texts are contained in this passage from Ephesians. What is he doing? He's proclaiming a truth that can no longer be demonstrated or proved philosophically, but only by a form of faith that must exist prior to this. So it is not simply a negation the possibility, uh, but actually an afgehoben, a lifting up, a negation that preserves and restores, in a sense, the original image of, that pa of all of that secular tradition of philosophy that we talk about as a modern philosophy, and fulfills, in a sense, the mission, evangelion, his missionary, his gospel, his mission, in the contemporary moment. The work of uh, Agamben is our modern Paul. He is bringing the good news that Christ is risen and that basically that to restore again all things under the head of Christ. If you excuse the pun, this is a way of dehistoricizing the entire tradition, the secular tradition of modern philosophy, which has been, in a sense, the bane, let's say, and the basis of many of the, as we talked about earlier, the reaction against a previous culture or tradition that is the culture of secularism, the culture of anti-humanism, the culture of modernism, culture of modernity. Was, these were the cultures of philosophy that are being reacted against today by procedures that in a sense can be demonstrated in this. In its modern development under capitalization in the late democratic state, and thus to restore or recover and set upright actually to turn on its head the full and Christian essence of parousia, the fullness of time. Here Agamben's theological reading of time between resurrection and parousia, the end of time, is both extremely accurate, theologically speaking, and highly performative. Here eschaton, or the time, actually, which means the time between, between resurrection and uh, parousia, the time between resurrection and return, is neither some supplemental time added on to time before or the past, neither is it a time of waiting or idleness. Rather, it is the completion of all times in one time, it's so that it is an incompletion of the future that can no longer be grasped by means of the engines or the machines of economic or juridical forms of calculation or political concepts or secular concepts of history, but can only be grasped, again, within their full and original theological and faithful essence. To put this in a more messianic figural language, in the time that remains, that is the time that we are living through now, which is no longer historical time, but eternity, since the Messiah has come, he is near, imminent to every moment, and he will come again. And the subject today, the contemporary must subject, must now be attentive to all three tenses in every action and with every word that becomes in the future an oath or a promise to another. Moreover, it is because of the fullness and the completeness of time, which is present all at once. This is what allows or authorizes, actually, Agamben to employ Paul's original epistle to the Romans as being contemporaneous, as being our contemporary to the readers in the contemporary world. Because today, in a certain sense, we are the Romans in the same way that it allows Paul and Benjamin to become contemporary and fellow travelers. Finally. Here I underline the significance of the speech or proclamation that we have witnessed at the conclusion of Agamben's epistle, which is said to be performative of the faith in the parousia. The word is no longer the Greek logos of philosophy, which, as Paul said, uh, uh, basically the Greek, which, as Paul said, of words and codicils of the Jewish law was now just garbage. But neither is it the word of the Gospels, that is, not even theology, strictly speaking, since theological discourse has historically mistaken and deformed the fully active and essential meaning of the Christian word 
by consigning its origin to a past to a, that must be recovered in the present instead of a present that must be acted and performed in the moment that has no past. In the eternity between faith from hearing or hearing through the word of the Messiah. Thus, like the speech of Paul, which is neither rabbinic commentary nor, as he says, not a new gospel. Paul did not give a gospel. Okay, he was the apostle. Agamemnon's commentary is neither philosophy nor theology, nor is it allegory nor analogy, as in the Thomist figure of interpretation of the old and the new, of the old law and the new law, since it proclaims only to speak from the hearing of faith that Christ is resurrected, Christ is Lord, eternity is now. I'm going to skip uh, Badiou because that's a dramatic ending. Thank you.